Hi, I'm Michael, and today we're going to show uh, a force plate and demonstrate how it might be used to make accurate measurements in the laboratory. And like we often do, our accuracy goal is 1% or better. There are cases when we can be particularly careful and improve the accuracy much better than that, uh, but we'd like to at least use enough care to get the accuracy to 1%. So let's start talking about what it is that a force plate does. A force plate is something like a scale. And this is a market scale. I'm not sure if you can see the numbers on the front, but it's an accurately calibrated market scale that simply measures the weight of different items. And right now I have two 200 gram masses on there. And if you do the math, uh, if you do the math on that, uh, 400 grams is uh, very close to 0 0.880 pounds. So when the market scale reads 0 0.880 pounds, we develop confidence that at least for static forces, weights, the market scale is accurate. So now if we put something a little heavier on the market scale, and this is a, a, a weight that's meant for exercise, and it has 10 pounds written on the side, and the market scale says, well, that's not exactly 10 pounds. That's 9.505 pounds. And let's go ahead and let's convert that to newtons because for a lot of science and engineering purposes, research papers, science fairs, and things of this sort, uh, force is usually expressed in the uh, MKS or the SI unit of force, which is newtons rather than pounds. Not that there's anything really wrong with talking about forces in pounds, but from a more scientific point of view, most people communicate in newtons rather than pounds. So we come to Google and we Google up a unit converter for force. And it gives us several options. And this is a unitconversion.org, which is one I've used a lot. And so let's just convert uh, 9.505 pounds and let's see what that uh, well it, it might want us to scroll down and select pounds here 9.505 scroll down uh, to pounds convert it to newtons so 9.505 pounds is 42.28 uh, newtons so let's just write this down because we're going to use this See what the number was again. 42.28 newtons. We're going to use this uh, to double check the accuracy of our force plate. All right, so without further ado, let's shift the conversation to the force plate itself. And uh, this is an example of a force plate, and it looks something like a bathroom scale, and it measures force and we'll test it with a static force so you say well gee whiz what's so fancy about that why not just use a bathroom scale and what's special about the force plate is it doesn't just allow the accurate measurements of static forces like weight or something that's constant but it allows the measurement of dynamic forces that are changing over time so if there's an event like uh, walking or uh, a collision or a push or a pull force that's changing in time uh, dynamic force measurements can measure the force at some sampled interval throughout the event and this force plate allows sampling at 500 samples per second or a thousand samples per second so even if you have an event that takes much less than a second it can measure how the force is changing throughout that event. All right, so let's go ahead and let's uh, look here at the uh, computer screen. And we use a, a software program called uh, Logger Light. Uh, you can download it for free from uh, vernier.com. And it's just a utility that, uh, that runs the, uh, the force plate. All right, so we've brought up logger light, but we haven't really given a complete description of our hardware yet, so let's take a moment to do that. 
the vernier force plate is the sensor and we've co connected the sensor to this vernier lab quest and what the lab quest is it's an interface that goes between the force plate and the computer because the force plate has an output voltage that then needs to get rid uh, the output voltage gets read by a uh, analog to digital converter here and then it communicates digitally through the uh, USB connection to a computer and it's just connected to a notebook computer running the logger light uh, software. So it wants to start off by telling us that uh, at least to begin with it thinks that the uh, force plate is reading negative and we can correct that by clicking the zero button here and then it readjusts and it's it's like if you were at the supermarket and you wanted to rate uh to weigh some produce but you wanted to weigh it in a tray so first you put the tray on the scale you could hit a button and zero out the scale so that you're only really measuring the weight of the produce and not the weight of the tray also so that's what the zero button does so now if we put the 10 pound weight on the force plate now it says that the, uh, bouncing around a little bit, it suggests that the uh, weight has a force of 45 newtons. And if you notice, that's a little bit different than the uh, 42.28 newtons that uh, we had calculated that it should be if things were working perfectly accurately. So let's go ahead and let's talk about this subject of uh, calibration because calibration is often important uh, when making accurate measurements uh, and there's a facility here uh, in the software that allows us to calibrate things accurately if we come to the experiment menu I want I'm gonna zoom in so we can see more accurately what we're doing here so we come to the experiment menu scroll down to uh, calibrate select the lab quest and the force plate we want to calibrate now in newtons and right now there's nothing sitting on the force plate so we enter a zero newtons because we know that the force applied on the force plate right now is zero newtons and then we put the 10 pound weight up there and we put our 42.28 newtons that we know corresponds to our 10 pound wait we hit keep then we hit done and then it's there's some noise and many electrical systems have noise hmm still coming up let's see what happens when we hit collect and we go ahead and run this for 10 seconds to see uh that noise that we're seeing most electronic systems have some noise and they bounce around a little bit let's see if the average over the scan uh turns out to be closer to 42.28 uh, 44.85 you know that really suggests uh, we should try recalibrating because uh, something about it doesn't want to hold the calibration so let's try calibrating again calibrate calibrate now now nothing's on it zero go ahead and put the 10 pound weight on it again 42.28 and now let's go ahead and average for 10 seconds because if you just leave the static situation on there it'll average over the 10 seconds and then we can see so now it says that the mean is 42.36 and uh, 42.36 is within 1% of 42.28 so now we've got some confidence in our calibration all right now let's demonstrate some of the unique features of uh, dynamic force measurements and this is like uh, let's consider this something like a pilot uh, study or preliminary study just to understand how settings work and how a, how a really well designed experiment might go but we're not actually going to save the data or, or use this for real careful analysis or draw any careful scientific conclusions from it we're more using this to demonstrate the instrument and some features that then would be used to design 
a more careful scientific experiment. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to run, I'm going to hit run, and now we're sampling the force. And I'm going to drop the tennis ball on the plate. Now I dropped the tennis ball twice from about the same height. We kind of expect that the two forces would be about the same in the two trials. So let's check and see, let's zoom in and see if we can see why we, we, we did about the same experiment. We dropped the tennis ball from about the same height and yet the forces uh, on the graph, one looks a lot bigger than the other one. So let's uh, see if we can't zoom in and discern from a little more careful inspection uh, what might really be happening. So that peak, uh, let's go ahead to axes. That peak starts at about uh, three seconds and goes to about 3.1 seconds. And let's see what's going on. Hmm. Maybe we didn't quite. Uh, Ah, we need to go out to like 3.2 seconds. Yeah, this zooming in and zooming out stuff is something that you do a lot uh, when you're making careful measurements. So, something that you'll get practiced at. And if you notice, what we see is that there's a sample here, a sample here, and a sample here. So, in that whole event of the tennis ball bouncing on the force plate, uh, and you could also see it here, we only got a couple samples under the event so we need to increase our sample rate because you can see that it's sampling every 0.02 seconds and that's a 50th of a second so why not in try increasing our sample rate to maybe uh, a thousand times a second so we go over, over here and we select data collection so rather than sampling 50 times a second we're going to increase our sample rate to a thousand times a second with the thought that uh, instead of maybe only getting two uh, data points underneath the curve that corresponds to the bounce of the tennis ball maybe we'll get uh, 20 or maybe even 40 points under the curve so we can map things out accurately all right so all right so now we, we did the experiment twice again, but with the faster sample rate. And now we're a little more confident that we're doing something that might be repeatable from a scientific point of view because now the two peaks uh, are a little more comparable to each other in their uh, magnitude. So let's uh, zoom in on one of them. All right, so when we zoom in from 3.5 to 3.6, uh, what we can see is that we've caught the whole event, uh, but we also see uh, after the event of the tennis ball impact, there's some noise where it goes negative and it goes back positive. And we know from watching the tennis ball bounce that this is the bounce event, but there's not really a negative and then a positive force after that. So what's going on? And there could be a few things happening. There could be uh, within the force plate itself some natural tendency to keep vibrating uh, after an impact on a short time scale like that. Uh, but more likely there's also some contributions from some weaknesses in our experimental design right now. Uh, you can't see everything but we've got the force plate uh, sitting on a paver, sitting on a cinder block and the cinder block uh, is sitting in the middle of a, of a table. So the table is going to be vibrating a little bit when the tennis ball hits. So even though we kind of raise it up like this to get it next to the computer screen for the convenience of making the video, if we were to really do an experiment that we wanted to be very accurately accurate scientifically, uh, we would set the force plate on the ground and preferably on a firm surface on the ground like a concrete paved floor, a concrete driveway, uh, something really uh, stable. Uh, more stable than the table so we wouldn't get this uh, extra bounce back part of it. All right, but uh, that uh, gives a good idea how the force plate works. And let's go ahead and run it again. And let's try something bigger this time, maybe a basketball. All 
All right, so uh, both trials of the basketball, the peak force is about 700 newtons, so it seems uh, somewhat repeatable. So we feel good about that. And let's go ahead and uh, zoom in here. And in this case, maybe from 4.8 to 5.0, just to get a look at uh, to get a look at that uh, peak a little more closely. All right, so we see the peak here, and it's about uh, 700 newtons tall. We could uh, really look at that more carefully if we wanted to, and uh, but we still have this kind of vibration and noise going on afterwards, which we think we could uh, ameliorate by uh, doing the experiment by setting the force plate on the concrete floor. And Let's also uh, highlight some, some nice features of the LoggerLite software here is that we can save and let's go ahead and I think we have a directory that I call Vernier because it's where I tend to save uh, uh, data files from the Vernier. So let's, let's take basketball uh, bounce force. Uh, for the name of the file and what that does is it saves it in a file format that's a little bit proprietary and that can only be read uh, by the LoggerLite software which can be useful if we want to open it back up in the LoggerLite software remind ourselves what our uh, settings were zoom in zoom out on the graph and so on but a lot of times we might want to import it into a different uh, plotting pr program or maybe a spreadsheet and that's where we set the export text and we can export it as a text file and let's go ahead and call it uh, basketball uh, bounce force but it'll automatically call it dot text if we don't put anything out there uh, and then it's kind of useful that uh, if we say navigate over to the same spreadsheet we've got uh, basketball bounce force is the name of the file we can open the file and see what we have in the file and what you can see you have in the file is you have two columns the first column is the time data acquired by the force plate measurement system and then the second column is the uh, force measurement that the force plate made in newtons and it's kind of a big file because we had uh, measuring a thousand samples per second for 10 seconds gives you a thousand uh, data points but this allows us it's easy then to import into a spreadsheet or any graphing program to analyze or to display uh, with different tools